Well, it's called order this Board of Franklin County Commissioners meeting for Wednesday, July 1st. Commissioner Sotomayor? Present. Commissioner Howard? Present. Chair Waymeyer? Present. Vice Chair Dickinson? Present. Commissioner Dunn? Present. If you'd please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance and then remain standing for the invocation, which will be led today by Pastor Leonard Chesbro of the New Life in Christ Church in Ottawa. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father God, we count a blessing we're able to gather together in this place today. I know, Lord God, you're going to get rid of this core of ours, and Lord, just protect all of us. And Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. And, and Lord God, I pray for all the uh, our county employees. I pray for the sheriff's department protection and the police department protection, the fire department protection and all the OMTs, Lord, just watch over them. And uh, Lord God, we know we're going to get through this because nothing is impossible with you. You can help us in anything that comes along like this. And we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. All right. Do we have any correspondence organizational business? Nope. Okay. Next is the public comment. Um, before we get started on that um, I think we've all all the commissioners received a lot of correspondence um, yesterday about the uh, mask mandate and before we start this conversation hear what everybody has to say which I'm uh, been interested to hear uh, been really good uh, input from what we've received yesterday and I'm looking forward to hear what everybody has to say today but I think to have the most productive conversation we can uh, it would be useful first for everyone to understand maybe the facts that are in front of us and uh, how we got here so that we're at least starting on the same page and then uh, uh, we can uh, discuss any differences from there of course the uh, order was given from the governor um, everybody knows that and it was uh, issued really without any notice to us it was a surprise to us as everyone else we weren't in on that process um, we were uh, taken off guard like everybody else I guess so um, many of you are here because uh, Apparently, we have the option to opt out um, uh, based on the legislation that was passed uh, um, when the uh, uh, disaster declaration was issued. Um, I think it's important to notice, know that it's not as simple as us just all agreeing that we opt out. There's a number of conditions that have to be met, which um, we can get into later. I don't want to dwell on that before you guys have time to speak. Um, it's important to know we don't have, to be frank, the ability to enforce this order. Um, the sheriff can speak more to that um, later as well, but uh, that's pretty uh, straightforward um, statement there. Um, this is not the first order that the governor has given, and there's not a single instance to my knowledge or anybody that I've spoken to of these orders being enforced statewide. 105 counties and numerous municipalities um, so before we start this conversation I know a lot of folks are scared about their civil liberties it is not possible somebody is going to force you to wear a mask that's not going to happen um, so uh, I think that's there's still a lot of details to work out and uh, a lot of things we can discuss but um, Hopefully everybody can uh, come into this conversation with a level head. There's no need to, you know, spoke to a lot of folks on both sides of this, um, for and against. Nobody came to this conversation. Everybody came to this conversation wanting to do what they believe is the best for the community. Nobody's here for bad reasons. There's no reason to insult each other. Um, not take a second and listen to the other person's point of view. Um, uh, nobody ever insulted another person into agreeing with them. I think that's uh, maybe an important thing to remember before we start this. So with that, let's move on to public comment. Uh, citizen desiring to speak on an item not on the agenda may do so at this time. Discussion is limited to five minutes and the commissioners not take action or discuss 
Items of this time, discussion should be limited to matters of county commission business, and public comment is not permitted in regards to personnel matters or on pending legal matters. Items introduced under public comment may become agenda items at a later date. Go ahead. Brian Webster. Good morning, County Commissioners. Good morning. Brian Webster, 1108 Osborne Road. Uh, purpose for my visit today is to ask a question and maybe I could get a response from the board. What's the value in creating accountability and why is it necessary to establish responsibility? As you know, Mr. Webster, this is your turn to speak and our turn to listen, so. That is a question. Question. Um, I read to you the policy on public comment. We're here to listen. I was looking for some input. That's now a comment. Public comment is for. Uh oh. I'm sorry. My question is not appropriate. Is my question not appropriate? The comment is not to start a discussion on something. It's basically for you to make statements. It says, as the chair just told you, that if uh, it could become an agenda a lot, item at a later date. But the public comment isn't where we start in the t discussion back and forth on anything. We You're free to contact any of us at your own will. We're I apologize. I was just looking for your opinions on the matter. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I'll catch up with you on a personal level. That would be awesome. Thank you. Mike Sleister. Uh, mine is on the ma face mask. If you could, if you could please state your name and address for oh. the county commission. <laughs> Mike Slicer, uh, Rantoul, Kansas. Uh, myself, I, I'm probably one of the people that has more to gain and lose by the face mask wearing or not wearing. I have a big event coming up on the 25th of this month. And personally, I've made it a strict rule that everybody must wear a face mask. Reason is, is one, you know, everybody talks about their civil liberties. It's a violation of my constitutional rights. Well, you know, that is if it's an individual thing that, you know, affects your life. Well, you got seat belt laws, you got car seat laws. Those don't affect everybody. It just affects you if you get in a wreck or if you got a child with you and you get in a wreck. Smoking laws, so on down the line. Things that are violations of everybody's civil liberty laws, individual civil, li civil liberty laws. But yet nobody complains about them, nobody talks about it. it's a violation. Nobody's protesting it, nobody's sitting there going uproar on Facebook or anything. This here isn't about an individual. This is about each and every person that's sitting in here, each and every person in this county. It's about keeping everybody as safe as possible. True, face mask not be may not be 100% uh, you know uh, effective, but either is a condom. But we still use them for safe sex. <laughs> Several things like that we could go into that are the same thing, but the thing is you're talking individuals comparison to this here. This here involves everybody. This isn't about your civil liberties, your civil liberties, his, hers. It's about all of us. They talk about it's their right not to wear one. It's also the other people that have health conditions that, you know, are very vulnerable to this virus that also have rights to stay safe. It is you as, the, as you know, members of this county that take care of all this, as well as our government, to keep each and every one of us safe. So that way we feel safe. 
Is anybody scared? Well, there's people. I, I'm not scared of anything, you know, pure and simple. But do I think it's smart? Yeah, it's smart. It's just being smart. But in my opinion, yeah, there should be a mandatory face mask wearing because it's not helping just you. It's helping everybody around you. It's something that we need to have. It's something that, you know, there's no reason to, you know, other than, well, might mess up your makeup a little bit, might mess your hair up a little bit. You know, some people, they just don't want to wear them because they look stupid. Well, you know, if you have personal things like that, maybe you need, you know, maybe you need to really rethink you the, the whole deal because it's not about you. It's about everybody. It's the collective. It's all of us. Just be smart and think about it. If you're, you know, because otherwise you just, you know, and this isn't an insult on anybody. It's just about being selfish and, you know, not thinking about everybody else. And I hope, you know, that there is some way it can be enforced because, you know, like a seatbelt law, it doesn't affect you if I get in a car wreck, but I still have, it's still a law. It doesn't affect you if my if I got a kid in the car with me and that kid dies also because I didn't put him in a car seat. That's on me, but it's still a law. There are ways around this that can be done. There are several states that have done this in the, uh, before when the first outbreak came. So there are ways of doing this. There are things that can be done. It can be made into a, you know, hey, either you do it or, you know, you get fined, you know, type deal. Like I said, this isn't about each individual out here. It isn't about civil liberties. It's about keeping everybody in this county safe. It's about keeping everybody here healthy. And we live near some of the biggest outbreak counties in this state. So I think it's just smart thinking to do it. Right. Thanks. I appreciate Thank your you. time. Thank you. Emily Harvey. Please state your name and address. Emily Harvey, 622 South Sycamore here in Ottawa. Go ahead. Um, okay, so from my personal viewpoint, um, what is happening right now has very little to do with whether or not masks work or don't work. Um, of course, that's where all the argument seems to be on every forum under the sun. Yesterday, I saw a couple men planning to meet at the Princeton um, gas station to solve this problem with their fists. Um, and so everyone has an opinion on that. But I personally believe that what you guys actually have to decide um, has very little to just do with actually whether or not masks work and much more to do with um, making it a mandate and also sending a signal to a governor that they can have the overreach that Governor Kelly keeps trying with these statewide mandates. Um, so one of the things in the mandate is it says anywhere in which social distancing of six feet cannot be maintained and that includes outside, which I have a problem with as kids that go outside and um, this is a thing. Um, it is my view that to make this a mandate is unnecessarily divisive. Franklin County is doing an amazing job. We have a very excellent rate as you look around at other areas and other countries and so to make it a mandate is to draw a hard line in the sand that makes every all the community draw a hard line in the sand and I think will actually exacerbate the problem um, yesterday I went to pay my tags and I realized as I was sitting there and everyone was all masked up I felt very uncomfortable like everybody did we were all very uncomfortable um, but it took a very long time to get our tags and people started tentatively talking and as they did everyone came to realize that everyone in that hallway thought that masks were unnecessary and did not work and actually caused damage to people who are wearing them at, on the job instead of improving um, however everyone still wore them because they were trying to be kind and courteous to everyone else in the hallway even though they personally disagreed and I believe that if this becomes a mandate, that feeling goes away and people are now dug in their camps. I'm not gonna wear it because you said I have to, as opposed to I'm being a good community member, or 
I'm going to wear it, and if I see someone in Walmart, I'm going to verbally assault them, which we have seen in several other states that have made mandates. It makes both camps dig in their heels, and I don't believe it's actually, and I think Governor Kelly is starting a problem that never needed to happen, is my view on it. Um, also, one of the things that um, you've already addressed but was a concern for me was enforcement. Um, law enforcement's not exactly having a fantastic year, and to throw this on top of them as well to decide on you know how all that goes if you see people at the park and you don't believe they're social distancing correctly if we put that on our officers that's just very unfair and how even do you begin to enforce something like that practically in a county like franklin county um, the other thing that concerned me is in her wording she said that we were going to continue to do this cycle until the vaccine is available widely manufactured and widely distributed. The human race has never, ever had a vaccine for a corona-based um, disease. And so she's literally pinning on this on something that we've never accomplished. So that leaves a lot of power in her camp to continue to put our communities through this cycle every month or so, which I believe if the counties of Kansas put their foot down and are like you don't have the authority to do this that will stop her from putting us through this circle so that's my basic point so not whether or not the masks work but just what it does to our community if we make this a mandate instead of a recommendation or a request so that's all i got and i rambled a lot i'm sorry <laughs> thanks emily all right no no sorry you had your, you had your time um nick no, you no. Can't. I'm sorry, sir. We listen to you and respect your time. You had the floor. Um, this isn't a, a public argument. Consent agenda is next up. That's it for public comment. All right. Our consent agenda today would be uh, to approve minutes from the June 24th meeting, the June 29th study session, claim vouchers in the amount of $176,775.61 payroll in the amount of $1,186,801.28 and that's for the period of May 21 to June 20th. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as read? Make the motion. All right, is there a second? Second. Commissioner Sotomayor? Yes. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Chair Wehmeyer? Yes. That brings us to items of business, the first of which is to consider approving the solicitation of bids for the district court HVAC replacement project. Brandon Sands, our maintenance director, is here to tell us more about this item. Good morning. morning. Good morning. Um, I've been working uh, pretty closely with uh, Latimer Summers, the engineers that are uh, getting this project put together for us for the HVAC. Uh, project for the district court um, they're just wrapping up their uh, plans for that and so they'll be ready um, actually next week um, with your approval to uh, uh, put that out to bid so we can get our contractor selected um, so we can start that work uh, to be clear we're looking at a time frame around uh, uh, right around the beginning of October for that project to start Well, this is something we've talked about and budgeted for and um, been on our radar for a while. Does anybody have any questions for Brandon? Doesn't sound like it. Would anyone like to make a motion to uh, approve the solicitation of bids for the district court HVAC replacement project? I would make that motion. Great, thanks. Is there a second? Okay. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Sotomayor? Yes. Chair Wehmeyer? Yes. Thanks, Thanks, Brandon. All right. Our second item of business is, con is to consider approving and signing the Iowa Terrace Project specifications and contract documents. David? Commissioners, uh, as you recall, uh, we have been working on this project for quite some time. Uh, we finally were able to acquire the easements uh, and then get the project bid. Uh, this is the um, the end of that initial pro process. Once um, uh, the the contract documents are signed, that officially starts the clock on the project. Uh, as soon as they are signed, 
today will be the early start date for um, Underwood to be able to begin the project. Uh, he does have, a, I think it's an August 10th uh, late start date, but once he uh, sets foot on the project, he's got 30 days to complete it. Um, but the first step in that is obviously getting uh, the, the contracts executed. He's already signed them. He's got his bonds in place. All of that is ready to go. Uh, we just need to execute the contract. Right. For anybody who's not aware, this would be a project that's replacing some very large uh, drainage uh, tubes and the work associated with that. Right. Any questions for David? I don't have a question. This is the project where, for just public's knowledge, uh, the bids came in at a very, very different. Yes. Uh, high to low yeah. was extremely uh, large gap there. Uh, this bid came in extremely low compared to the engineers. They thought it would the area that they, they had predicted it would cost. So this is, was a very low bid compared to the other bids. So, um, But you have made the comment that he's bonded and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. The, uh, the, the engineer's estimate was right at $200,000 for this project, and this particular bid was just under $90,000 uh, to, to complete that. Um, uh, our engineer has kind of checked on things and conferred with the, the contractor, and uh, we're, we're ready to go. We feel comfortable. But, uh, he can complete this project for that cost like we want it to be completed. So. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions for David? Would somebody like to make a motion to approve the Iowa Terrace project specifications and contract documents? I'll make a motion to approve the project. All right. Is there a second? Mr. Dickinson? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Stottlemyer? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Chair Waymar? Yes. All right. For our third item of business, we need to consider amending the county's code of ethics conduct in order to comply with requirements of the CDBG grant. Eric? Yeah, we have a handful of items here regarding the CDBG grant. Um, I'll ask Paul to come up and talk us through that. Um, we continue to receive guidance from the state as we work through this process, so please be patient with us. I know we've already discussed this with you several times, but these are new requirements that we have recently found out about. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thanks, Derek. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, I want to echo that. These are um, things that keep coming up. And some of this is uh, the consultant that we're paying to help us with this has bird dogged these things out for us and has been very good at saying, here's the documentation the state's now wanting, here's what you need to do. They've given us the wording. Um, so all of these documents are basically a procedural step, to be quite honest, uh, to check the box with the state so that we can continue to move forward with the CDBG funding. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's kind of the overview of the documents that uh, we're asking about. So the first item is truly just procedural. We've had a code of ethical conduct. I don't know how long we've had it. It's been here for the entirety of the six years that I have been here. Um, it doesn't, <clears throat> it hasn't historically had a penalty provision in it. You know, I, I, I guess I have independent thoughts on whether or not it needs a penalty provision, but for purposes of receiving these grant funds, we're being told we need one. And so I've included language. It is basically from a template sent to us by our consultant um, to add to that just for purposes of receiving this money and being able to distribute it to local businesses. What are the... I guess penalties you want to out? Well, the, the language here, just the, the, I am asking that you amend it to include the following clause, violations of this code of ethical conduct by the county's elected officials, appointed officials, officers, employees, or agents of the county may be prosecuted to the fullest extent permitted by local, state, or federal law or regulations. States the obvious. States the obvious. 
right. So this one, um, somebody like a motion, like to make a motion to pass the uh, amended code of ethics conduct for the county. Second. I will second it. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Sotomayor? Yes. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Chair Waymeyer? Yes. All right. Fourth item of business is similar. Go ahead, guys. Who wants to take it, Derek? Um, yes. Gar. This one's to consider adopting a county civil rights and fair housing policy. Yeah, so the exact same principle um, for purposes of receiving these funds, we have to have a civil rights fair housing policy. That policy is in front of you and it speaks for itself. Um, this is uh, a policy that if you adopt, we will add to our, you know, our list of policies. We'll have it on our website and it's at this point this is strictly for procedural purposes so that we can receive these funds policy stating that we essentially follow the federal laws regarding civil rights and fair housing motion to approve this item i will make a motion to approve this item second so i'd like to go ahead mr sotomayor yes Commissioner Howard? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Chair Waymeyer? Yes. All right. And then our fifth item is considered for approval revised guidelines for Franklin County's CDBG program. You have a, a, a revised set of guidelines in front of you. Um, Paul highlighted the uh, revisions. Um, and we just approved these guidelines not two weeks ago and have already been given additional guidance. But, um, Paul, do you want to talk them sure. through the, the specifics? The main difference that they've kind of waffled back and forth on is the time frame of uh, that is available for reimbursement. And they've gone back and forth. I may recall I came to you and you awarded us the ability to do it over a 90-day period. Uh, state came back said, no, you can only do 60 days. And so then they met again, I guess, and they've decided uh, we can only uh, reimburse for expenses for 60 consecutive day period, but we can go longer for lost revenue. And that is strictly up to each county. And so I'm recommending we just cap that at what you indicated before is 90 days. So an example of the application that you're going to look at today that's 60 days of inventory that we're looking to reimburse in 90 days of lost revenue so that's the change the previous rule was just 60 days for everything All right. good chance dealing with the state that this won't be the last time you're in front of us i i <laughs> doubt it what if we give them the money and then they come back and say no 90 days doesn't work uh, I, it's documented 15 ways, so if they did, they'd have a hard time between us. Uh, conversations I've had, conversations our consultant has had, every time there's a change, I keep that email, so I've got something in writing from whoever it is that's directing us at the time. Um, and then, quite frankly, I've con reconfirmed and reconfirmed several times on several of these just to make sure. Well, we need a motion to uh, approve the revised guidelines for Franklin County's CDBG program. Motion to approve. All right. Thank you, Don. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Stoudemire? Yes. Chair Waymeyer? Yes. And our sixth item is to review application for CDBG funds and consider for approval awarding said funds. This is the one application that's been completed to date. Just to kind of give you an overview, uh, we continue to receive interest in partial applications as people work to, to uh, find the funds. I went in the office this morning, already had a phone call for another one. So I've got three potential applications coming from Wellsville as we speak one another one from Williamsburg 
and uh, several among the county. I'm working on two of them in Lane. Um, so uh, as I travel around the county and kind of try to spread the word, uh, I think I've shared with you when I'm in your district, but um, kind of good news is some of these small businesses have just flat out said, I'm doing fine, don't need the money. So that's been encouraging uh, on many levels. We've also had several applications I've had to uh, inform they did not meet the LMI requirements. Um, so we've had, I think, three so far that have, have expressed an interest that I've had to basically tell them they just didn't qualify based on those low to moderate income guidelines. This particular application, um, I, I double checked with the state, triple checked with the state how much information uh, to share from a public standpoint and what we didn't have to share or shouldn't share from a public standpoint when you're dealing with people's finances. Uh, the state does require that I, I share his name, the applicant's name, the amount of money they're requesting, uh, and also the purpose of the use of the funds. So today I bring forward to you, and I believe you've received information and packet on it. Uh, this is an application from Mr. Fred Funk. Uh, he lives near Homewood. Uh, he is a self-employed taxidermist and he is seeking reimbursement for expenses again for a 60-day period for for his inventory which i've received the invoices the paid invoices uh, from april 1st to may 30th and he's also seeking um and so that number for invoices is uh, included in his grant request and then also for lost revenue and the way we document that on in this particular case is take last year's tax return for the business and divide that total for the year by 12 and then we take it now that we can go 90 days we take that times three so that's kind of the math behind how we got the numbers and i believe uh, i sent you a spreadsheet that breaks it down but the total request from mr funk which has been approved by the committee and also these run through our consultant who looks for everything that we're documenting it correctly so we have a pretty good check and balance system Mr. Funk has met these requirements, uh, so the amount requested is $3,831.90. I'm happy to answer any questions or... Very thorough. Between the documents you've given us and your presentation. Nothing? I just thank Paul for... Yeah, he, had, he hadn't been waiting for people to come to him. He, I know, I've had contact from couple of towns in my district that he has uh, reached out to them and uh, to the mayors and other people and and uh, and not just drop the ball there I know he's offered to help people walk through the process besides just sending them the paperwork and expect them to figure it out I know he's been I know he's offered a couple people to, to even look over their past taxes and so forth and and just just to help them get get it put it in the right way, so I commend him for that. So, um, are we ready for approval? Yep, I believe we're I'd right. like to make approval to uh, application for Mr. Fred Funk. All right. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Dickinson. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Sotomayor. Yes. Commissioner Howard. Yes. Chair Wainwright. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Brings us to staff reports. Derek? Yeah, I'll uh, <clears throat> start with a brief spark discussion or uh, federal relief funds we've talked about several times. Um, I had a meeting with all of our department heads and elected officials yesterday and, and um, encouraged them to begin brainstorming immediately on um, potential ways that we can utilize these funds as an organization in the process of setting up a meeting with other municipalities within the county as well as the school districts uh, to encourage them to do the same thing haven't received any more guidance since the last time we spoke on it but we you know I believe very strongly that there are certain things that are, are pretty well guaranteed for reimbursement that that each of these entities could use just in terms of PPE um, 
you know, hand sanitization stations, uh, those infrared thermometers, like you think about school being back in session potentially and all of the things that uh, may very well be necessary in order to do that safely. I think we'll be able to generate a lot of ideas. Um, and so we're in the process of doing that. Um, I've worked very closely with Nick and Sari on the health department and what that's what the needs of the health department are going to look like heading into the fall. Um, I have approved uh, three new positions, um, each of which are going to be paid for with these funds. Um, and, and we believe that we've got solutions to pay for these positions through the end of next year, if need be, w without an adverse budget impact. Um, one of them is going to be an RN position. Um, the other will be an LPN. And then we're looking at, uh, and Nick can jump up here in a bit and correct me, but something akin to a clerk two position to perform administrative duties. Um, I don't know when things are going to go back to normal for the health department. Um, so it's entirely possible that these positions are with us for the long haul. Um, I think they've been very well thought out. Um, appreciate Nick and Sari putting the time into this that they have. Um, but we believe that this is going to help bolster us for what we feel like is invariably going to be an uptick in COVID-19 going into the fall. Um, regarding COVID, and Colt, you did a pretty good job of outlining this. Um, there is a state order. Um, I have not seen it. I have no idea what is going to be in the governor's executive order. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there's not a single local government official across the state of Kansas that has seen the language of that order. Um, we are being told that we will see it on Thursday, um, mere hours before it's supposed to go into effect. I believe that we probably will. But as you can imagine, it's incredibly hard to provide counsel on something that I haven't seen. Um, that being said, we, I generally believe that it is going to mandate masks in public spaces. Um, that is what I don't know what the state is going to consider a public space. I know she mentioned restaurants and, and shops. And so my belief is that it would be pretty broad. Um, we do not have to sub be subject to that order. Um, the legislature did give us a mechanism to opt out of it at the local level if we choose to do that. Um, I am recommending that we don't choose to do that. Um, I've got Dr. Ransom here as well as Nick and we can talk through the specifics of why that is. Um, but I do want to talk about enforcement of this and what it means to be a mandatory order. Like the word mandatory is the, we're really just talking about semantics because if, if we know that we're not truly going to enforce it at the local level, then the fact that it's quote unquote mandatory means absolutely nothing. And we have been subject to several mandatory state executive orders throughout this pandemic. As you said, Cole, there hasn't been a single instance in Franklin County or that I am aware of statewide where the quote unquote mandatory order has actually been enforced. And so unless the state plans on enforcing its own order, which again, I don't think they have done a single time through this pandemic, then mask usage truly will not be mandatory. Um, that being said, um, you know, when Dr. Ransom talks, I listen. Um, when Chief Robin talks, I listen. Um, and generally do believe that masks work. 
And I do believe that we should support the governor's order and we should encourage mask usage. I'm going to recommend that people who do business in county facilities wear masks. Law enforcement, as opposed to taking a true enforcement approach, um, I would like for them to assist in the distribution of masks not tell people you have to put these on, but make sure that masks are getting where they need to be. Um, I've had the discussion with our team. We have ramped up our ordering on masks. It is frustrating that we just learned about this because with more time, we could have had a lot more masks on hand and we could have done a better job. And, and we have a nice surplus to start from, but when you talk about a county of 25,000 residents, like you need a lot of masks to, and we just, we don't have that. And so there is gonna be a lag time. I've spoken with the city manager of Ottawa who talked to his police chief. Uh, the chief of police agrees uh, in this approach in terms of uh, approaching it truly as a public servant, trying to get the mass dispersed to businesses, to individuals as needed. And so my recommendation to the board um, is not that we pass our own order lessening restrictions. Um, it's that we view the state's order for what it is um, and that we approach it on a local level in a way that makes the most sense for our residents. And I believe that is what was just outlined. But I would like Dr. Budd to come up and talk about the importance of masks and, and why we support this order. I believe that masks are important and I think there's good empiric evidence that they are in a lot of ways. I think we can look at those countries that traditionally have worn masks and they have clearly blunted the effect of this virus, especially the Asian countries, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Singapore. They simply have had few deaths. Uh, the incidence is well under control and that's because those people for years have worn masks <clears throat> we never this country never accepted masks and i think it was on the there was the premise that these masks really don't protect me from somebody very well but they do reduce my exposure to other people and that's that's where things have changed as of three or four months ago when the whole population wears masks, there are really good studies that show if 80% of us wear masks, the incidence of the disease goes down by 90%. So we're never going to get everybody to wear them, and we have no way of forcing it. Um, I think businesses could recommend it. In our office, we require it. If you don't wear it, we're not seeing You're not coming in. And I think an individual business can do that. Government offices could do that. Um, but if they choose not to, we're not going to be very effective. I think the evidence is absolutely clear that masks are uh, helpful and we should encourage it as much as possible and we can mandate it. <laughs> but, I, you know, we're faced with the same thing. We can't enforce it. So are there any questions about that? Questions for Dr. Budd? Appreciate you coming and speaking. I think it's pretty straightforward, though. So, uh. well, and 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 his guidance to the health department, uh, to my staff, has been critical throughout this pandemic. So certainly we appreciate you, Dr. Ransom, and and your continued help with this. I, I do have one question, and sure. and I read that in a lot of states that we actually know what the mandate says that and I've heard from restaurants that if you are in the process of eating consuming a meal or you know drinking a drink then the masks do not apply obviously to those. Yeah, so I mean, I mean so I am assuming that that's going to be a part of or I mean I, that would 
Would you, what would you say to that? Hopefully the, the situation, the arrangement in the restaurant is there is sufficient physical distancing with other people that the uh, patrons do not have to wear their mask at the table when they're eating. I would encourage the waiters and servers to, you know, anybody, all the employees to wear masks. Um, so everything we can do will help some. I mean, it, all, you know, but obviously when you're eating in a restaurant, you, you won't be able to wear a mask, and that's, that's acceptable. I don't have a question, but I just want to kind of comment. You can jump in here if I'm wrong. The way I read over parts of a, <clears throat> the bill 2016, which is where they gave us the power to override the governor if we wanted to, basically. Um, my understanding out there was three things that need to happen if we were to do that. One was we were to be able to show documentation to the state that we talked with our health officer and they advised that we it was not necessary, we didn't need to follow that. So I think everybody out there on the special committee knows that uh, this is our health officer and his thoughts on this. So, um, and we really didn't even fit the, the other two, the two and three didn't fit us either. It was talking to other health officials and they telling us that it's not necessary. And I think Nick could talk on that when he gets there. So he'd be one of the other health officials and I know how he feels about it. So. I don't think, uh, and we had to show a letter to the state why we were overriding them because of these circumstances. So the circumstances are not in our favor to come up and say, no, we're not going to follow this. Well, and there are, like, I appreciate <laughs> the fact that that bill was passed because there are counties in the state of Kansas you think about some of your northwestern counties, for example, that it makes perfect sense to um, opt out of this and that would have no trouble demonstrating the, the requirements that the legislation mandates. We, as you said, and Dr. Bud can elaborate on, we, we can't do that yet here. Like our case numbers are not, they have not been declining for a couple of weeks. And Nick will, will touch on this and, and we are incredibly limited in what we're going to say, but we did just suffer our first death from COVID in Franklin County. And so it's, it's not declining. Like we're not beating this in Franklin County. We're just not. Um, and, and so I, you're right. I'm not sure that we, you know, technically could even meet those requirements, but irregardless, I, it's not our recommendation that we even try at this point. It is interesting to note that there are many states that have vast requirements and there are none of those states that put it back to the counties. <laughs> it's a state mandate. And I mean, there's one of them that you can be fined up to $5,000. No, we're not going to do that. But I saw on the news this morning that one of the top doctors of the CDC is, was recommending this morning that uh, this shouldn't be statewide mandates. It should be a national. Should be. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming in today. Yes, very much. All right, Nick. I think you can dovetail onto this conversation easily. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. I uh, got quite a bit to report to you this morning. Uh, Last week, as you well know, we were doing contact tracing throughout Wellsville. Um, we did have two positives from that over the weekend. We had five positives. Um, as Casey released in a press release this morning, we had our first death associated with COVID last night. So we're seeing COVID continue to grow in our county, and that, that's concerning. We're <clears throat> we're seeing in surrounding communities COVID growing in our younger excuse me, <clears throat> our younger group. So you look towards Miami County, they've had a large breakout in one of the schools over there. So we need to be cognitive of our behavior. Masks are essential to stop the spread, as Dr. Ransom has said. Um, 
One of the things Derek talked about is positions of the RN, the LPN, and the administrative person to help uh, with uh, the COVID response. With what we're seeing, we're testing well over 200 people at some time in the weeks. We have to contact all of those negatives back. What we run into with contacting them is some of them have voicemails that aren't set up. Some of them have phone numbers that, we, that they give us that aren't right. And it turns into a very lengthy process to call every one of those individuals and tell them what the results are. And, you know, there's going to be people that slip through the cracks because we try to leave a message. We can't. Uh, but we're doing our best with the staff we have. I have staff members, like I told you last week, that may be on the phone up to 9, 9.30 at night doing contact tracing, calling these negatives back. There, there's a lot of work going into the more the tests the more we do the longer our hours are getting to call people back make sure we're keeping that stuff up so i appreciate the support with that extra staff because honestly we're three months into this and continuing with no end in sight we're wearing staff out so we need to have that um, back to school conversations are starting june 9th the state's supposed to start with their guidance works closely with um, Wellsville, they're starting Zoom meetings to discuss what it's going to look like. I know Dr. Ransom has uh, been at Ottawa High School talking to them. So that's going to start ramping up. We're going to have back to school shots in the health department. We're going to uh, start seeing vaccines. One of the things that the state's trying to push are flu shots coming out instead of doing them in September and October. They're looking at August now. So that's going to be busy so a lot of things coming out of this one of the I had the opportunity yesterday to go to one of the uh, nursing facilities and talk to the residents there and you know just like general public the uh, residents of those facilities are getting impatient one of the ladies asked me when it would be over and you know I think that's the golden question is when will it be over we don't know what what's the new one for us going to look like um, a lot of good conversation came from that but I will tell you the mental health of our elderly that are living in those facilities is, is declining due to the fact that they can't see their loved ones and, and it's probably one of the most frustrating parts of my job I, I know we have meetings with them every day or every week to discuss reopening plans but that population is so vulnerable that we have to be very cautious and um, one of the com conversations with uh, those residents was it only takes one person to sneak a hug to have physical contact to put that into a facility and cause what we see breaking out all over so we uh, we're doing a lot of work with a lot of the facilities the schools trying to protect our uh, our kids our elderly and I uh, just wanted to let you guys kind of know what's going on with all that. So we uh, do have a, a couple contact tracing starting today. Uh, the state of Kansas has reached out to us. They will be short staffed from Thursday to Saturday. With the uh, increase of testing, the increase of positives throughout the state, we were getting turnarounds of about 36 hours. We're up to 48, we're up to four or five days now with some of our results coming back. Um, I'm very hopeful OFP Lab's gonna eventually pretty soon get the uh, rapid testing ab uh, ability, um, but we're, uh, we're starting to see that time frame of tests coming back, lengthening out, which again, causes frustrations to our general public, but with the truth, being known, if, if you have been exposed, you should isolate quarantine for 14 days. That negative test isn't a green light to go back to normal activities. So the education that goes along with this testing, that goes along with COVID is, is essential for us also. And I give Casey applause for keeping the public up to date on that, getting that information put out, but there's a lot of education to continue to do. With that, do you guys have any questions? My hairdresser said um, that she actually got to visit her mother in a nursing home um, only by going to an outside setting and her mom is here and she is here. 
And I thought, well, well, that would work. And then you said, sneak a hug. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Then, then you just blow it all out of water at that point. And that, that's the big thing that they're trying to do, the six-foot spacing, um, trying to get it outside where the chances of, of spreading it are thin, are, are, you know, possibly not going to happen. But with that, it is. It's that physical contact that I haven't seen my loved one for three months, and I want to give them a hug. I want, I want to show affection. And that, that's what the nursing homes, the, the, the assisted living facilities are trying to police, and it's it's been tough. Would you just turn around for just one second? Just turn around. All right, now you can turn back around. I, I figured you had a cape on because, oh. seriously, you must be Superman because right in the middle of COVID, your emergency communication center gets this big distinction. And my goodness, congratulations to all of you. Well, that was uh, the girls working really hard. They, they led that charge. They, they wanted it and, and achieved it. So the kudos goes to them. They did a great job. Any other questions that I can answer? Thanks, Nick. Good report. Um, Casey? All right. Sheriff? touch on the enforcement aspect or the non-enforcement aspect of the order. Um, the legislation that is out there, um, even if I had a desire to enforce the governor's executive orders, which I don't, um, I would not have the authority. Um, it is not a criminal act to violate um, her executive order. Um, it is a civil violation. Um, so law enforcement does not have the authority to to enforce it locally there's not a desire i don't know of anywhere where there is i think you've you you know expounded on that very well so um but one of the things mentioned in public comments was about well why can't we mandate it we in, we enforce seat belts and speed laws and things like that the big difference and we've had this discussion before is that driving is a privilege it is not a right and the argument that is made is that well i do have a right to life and so you're mandating that i wear that mask that's where the argument comes from um, there's going to be people come down on different sides of it and i understand that um, but the re but to me it's not a valid argument because driving is just a privilege and not a right and so that's why they're able to mandate those those different things so but from an, an enforcement aspect it is not a crime um, even if it was going to be enforced it would be a civil enforcement only so um, I got a question on yes that. sir so, I don't really understand if I read this right um, the other day on the news thing Douglas County has mandated the mask going into effect today that's correct I did read where they will be issuing citations for people not following that. Okay. So how they issue the citations on, on if it's not a... I'd have to read their enforcement aspect of it, but the statute... And that's what they said, it'd be like a $50 citation for a violation of that? I believe that they are issuing citations, yes. And to be clear, I am completely unaware of what the sheriff's talking about with regard to civil like i i'm not saying that that's not in there but i i am i am completely unfamiliar. i was just curious because i i did read where they they have issued their own basically they have and I, that could stricter than the, the state and, and that could be where the difference is house bill 2016 which uh, which governs all of this um that talks about the governor's executive orders not being a, a crime but they are a civil violation there, it may be something completely different since it is a county order that that they would be enforcing at that point. I don't know. I would because I, I'm not familiar uh, with that as well. I do. I've I've read their order, but I did not read their Douglas County's uh, enforcement mechanism of that. Um, I was just kind of curious as to how their order read because I didn't know if maybe they had some insight as to what may be coming down Thursday. And I do know that even on the, the mandate of the mask, there's a lot, there are um, 
there were several exemptions that, that were put in in place on that as well I'm, I'm in no way proposing that we do that I just know that I read that they were the ancient citations and yeah and I brought a said cop. there's no way to enforce it apparently there's civilly to... yeah the, the governor's order uh, is not enforceable right. criminally and I brought a copy of that I had talked with the chairman yeah uh, I think it was yesterday and um, so I brought a copy. I told him I'd bring him a copy of anything I found. So I did, I did bring a copy for him, and I'll get it to him after the meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Anything, Tad? Okay. All right. Um, David? Commissioners, we've um, spent a lot of time patching the last, uh, you know, the, the last several days. Uh, caught a bunch of locations on Shawnee Road uh, up by Wellsville. We've also uh, cleaned all the ditches on Finney Terrace just west of Princeton. Uh, that uh, actually held up really good in the, the, the last uh, four-inch rain that we had. Um, the, uh, the work that we did on the culvert replacement on the, in the 500 block of Sand Creek didn't suffer the same fate. Uh, we wrapped that up uh, Friday, um, and by Saturday morning at daylight, it was washed out uh, so we got the pleasure of uh, redoing that work uh, Monday morning uh, the big project that we're working on right now which is going to last several more days uh, is rebuilding the area around the intersection of Texas Texas and Finney Road uh, this project's being completed in conjunction with the Bergdahl brothers um, uh, we're cleaning out ditches rebuilding the the intersection and part of the road uh, and adding a couple of uh, crossroad tubes uh, while they are adjacent to the right-of-way reworking some of their terraces so that uh, the water that is coming off their fields doesn't hit the intersection uh, quite as quickly as it does right now we have continual problems with that area washing out and uh, their willingness to work with us uh, to resolve this is a a really a positive thing for us um, and we really appreciate uh, them working with us so um, once this is done this should resolve uh, the the problems that we have uh, in that area so that that's we've got a lot of folks on vacation so most of the folks that are here are working on that including two of our blade operators so uh, that's 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 it for right now David, I know you and I have spoke recently uh, at the start of this pandemic. We were concerned about our revenues um, and our ability to do um, several projects, not just those related to public works, but I asked you to start getting some ideas in the hopper because as it turns out our revenues have came in um, they're looking good our valuations on sales of properties have been um, where we want them to be and so i've kind of given you the green light do you want to briefly explain to the board some of the things that you're looking at sure so uh, if you recall last year we cut down the chip seal project so we had a little bit of extra money uh, we used that money to uh, do a patching and overlay job on the, the area on Nebraska Road south of Marshall and, and that uh, Labette Terrace intersection really made some major improvements that if you remember that road before uh, we did that work, it was, it was terrible. Uh, much better situation now. We also patched a, uh, um, several major areas along Rock Creek Road and, and then another spot up on Tennessee, uh, kind of north of the quarry that gets a lot of truck traffic. Um, um, the idea this year, since um, uh, you know, we could probably get a chip seal project in this year, but I think it's more prudent to do uh, significantly more patching and some overlay jobs similar to uh, what we did last year but just on a larger scale um, uh, we are starting to look at those locations that we want to include in a project um, and in the coming you know, over the next week or two we will be putting a project together um, this is being done in conjunction with the pavement management plan that um, that is being completed kind of as we speak here so sometime in the next few weeks we should have 
that document uh, completed and, and ready to go. Um, um, I think uh, Jackson Road uh, going into Miami County, um, that's one of the worst roads that we have in this county. Uh, that will definitely be, you know, on top of our list uh, to take care of. So uh, we'll we'll patch and, and overlay that road. Um, there's also some subdivisions that really need some attention. Uh, and and I had priced some of that last year, but the funds just weren't available. Uh, we'll get those included this year uh, to to do that. So I'm I'm hopeful that. Um, uh, August, September, we will have a uh, fairly significant paving job uh, to, to put out and really make some improvements on our asphalt uh, hard surface roads this year. Are you looking at doing that in-house or putting that out? No, we, we don't have the capability to do overlays um, and our patching is uh, we can do that kind of work, but it's um, we don't have a lay down machine and, and and some of the other pieces of equipment to do some of that. Um, uh, so we will contract that out and, and get a, a much bigger section done with folks that do that stuff every day. Kilo do ours last year? They did. They did. And historically, they've done uh, quite a bit. This is something that we will bid uh, just due to the, the magnitude of the project. But you're not talking to fall? laid patching in the past but if we're not going to come back and chip and seal over that that's that right that's it, that yeah it, it blade patching is is basically a skim coat um, and what we're we will do is uh, we'll mill some of those spots down to the to the base fill it back up and then go over it with uh, additional asphalt and that is a much longer term solution yes that'd be a yeah. full depth patch mm-hmm mm -hmm. and then you know, of course, uh, we'll get back on our, our chip seal next year. I'm still looking at um, whether it's feasible for us to do that ourselves. Uh, I've gathered information from uh, uh, several counties around us that do some of that, and, and I'll be in a study session coming up this summer. We'll, we will discuss those things. Correct me if I'm wrong, David, but, but the chip seal program, I mean, that's typically like it's like a nine hundred thousand dollar or so expense, and that, uh, whether or not to approve of that, came kind of right as COVID nineteen this pandemic began. So you may recall we discussed that with all of you, and we made the decision at that time because there was so much uncertainty. Exactly. And nine hundred thousand dollars, in a you know our budget's twenty five million dollars roughly. I mean that's a huge expense, and so we made the decision to put that on hold. But now, as David said, um, in lieu of that, we do think we can do some of this work and and still get a lot of improvements in. For the we county. decided at the idea of trans transitioning our resources towards asphalt, something that actually adds structure mm -hmm. to the road i mean yep. chip seal is good to seal and keep the weather out and it looks good on top but it doesn't add structure to a road so. in, a, in an ideal situation we would be able to do both sure um uh, currently it's a um, it's not completely an either or yeah but uh definitely when you're looking at um you know close to a million dollars for chip seal for 40 to 50 miles of uh, a road every year that doesn't leave a lot for us to be able to go and, and contract out a lot of um, 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 additional asphalt work. And so we're left with blade patching ourselves, um, but we're not able to, to keep up with the demand uh, that we're seeing on our roads. Um, typically these roads need to be uh, rebuilt every 15 to 20 years, depending on circumstances. We've never been able to do that. We cut a lot of that back on the flooding first started when the, all the flood damage and of course COVID come in right behind that. So yeah. it's been a interesting couple of years. You'll know, um, and this is something I've waffled on bringing to light or not publicly. But all these calamities began about the same time I hired David Lee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a common thread there. <laughs> there is. But. All right. Janet? 
The only thing I have is uh, I've had a lot of questions about sample ballots and people getting to see their ballot in advance, and they are available online. Um, there is a link on my website. Um, Casey and I are going to be working on getting something out right after this meeting. Um, and you can look up your voter registration in the link that's on uh, my webpage. And you can um, see your sample ballot that's specific to your area. So um, I encourage everyone to go on there and look at their sample ballots. So. Got a question, Janet. Uh, came out in the paper there yesterday, or yesterday about the closures of certain polling places. Oh, yes. Have you had any questions about that or comments? Or? We've had a few calls about it, but but not too much. Um, we did um, get something out on our social media last week, letting people know that there were going to be some closures. And um, I'm happy to to talk with anyone about specific locations if if they'd like. Um, as as you guys know, and and Don, um, Roy, you sat on that committee. I hosted a committee meeting earlier in the year, and um, I think that. With COVID, it just exacerbated some of the problems that we were discussing about some of the locations and how we were going to handle some of those. And so, you know, some difficult decisions had to be made when in regards to how we're going to keep people safe at voting locations. I want everyone to feel like they can go out to a voting location and vote if that's what they want to do. Um, I don't think that that everyone is at the same place with COVID. Some, obviously, we've heard today, some people want to wear face masks and some people don't want to wear face masks. And some people want to vote at home and some people want to vote at their polling location. Everything that have been options in the past are still options. You can still vote at your polling location the same hours that you always have. You can still vote in the courthouse in advance. We're still offering extended voting hours a couple of days till seven o'clock. We're still offering a Saturday. We, are, we have not stopped anything that we have done in the past. Um, so I think even with closing these locations, um, these citizens uh, have plenty of opportunities to vote. And we, as we reviewed in the committee that, that you sat on, we are not asking these people to drive an extended length to get to their new poll locations. I'm not asking everyone to come to Ottawa to vote. You're, you still have voting locations and outlying areas. So again, I would encourage anyone to call my office if they have questions about that or concerns. Thanks. Commissioner's comments, board reports. Don? I did attend uh, Wellville last Wednesday. Uh, they have uh, made a move up there in their police department. And they are going to purchase body cameras for all their officers up there. That's something they're moving forward with. There's a lot of discussion over uh, trying to get another source for their water. They've had a real problem up there with their water pressure. And uh, I know the maintenance man, they asked what to do to solve it. And he said a new tower, a new line, talking $3 million. So they're looking a little different avenue. They've been talking to uh, uh, Edgerton. Of course, they go through uh, Hillsdale, and they're, they're discussing, and he may even get a lower price than what they're paying now. Uh, but they're not going to give up the one they got now. They just want to. Uh, so uh, uh, they were uh, built. The mayor was thankful. They comments on Paul that, uh, you know, how he had uh, reached out to the city up there in the chamber and the businesses to, on our grant program that, that it's just out there willing to help them. Um, I did uh, get a call the other night from uh, them working with the Lane Fair Board, and I know they've been contacting uh, the administration here and helpful, and they've come to a bad decision. I mean, a good decision, but bad. They are going to cancel the fair this year at Lane. First time it's been canceled since the uh, polio pandemic, I believe in 44, they said. So, Anyhow, they, they 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 hung in there till the last moment, but they finally they did call me the other night, and well, they called me several times, and, and I told them to contact Derek's office or, or Casey or or uh, Nick or you know anybody like that to to give them a little more idea on on the uh, COVID issue, a lot better than I can give them information. I mean, cause I personally hate to see them. 
quo, but they they did it for the right reason. So that's uh, all I have. All right, Rick. I don't really have anything. I was going to comment on some of the emails uh, that all of us received on the mass last night. I just want to say that I had several, as we all did, and uh, several of them were against the mask mandate, but there was several of them that were for the mask also. And, and I read each one of them, and I'm sure everyone did, but all I wanted to say is most of them stayed respectful, and I appreciate that, and they gave their opinions and why, and like I said, I appreciate most of them uh, were respectful and that I appreciate that. Um, don't do Facebook. I'm not sure Facebook stayed that way all the way, but I, <laughs> other than that, I don't lucky. know. So that's all I have. I am. I will be absolutely glad when COVID-19 is not the main topic of conversation everywhere you go. Um, one thing that I think we should bring up is that if you if, if you got laid off from your job during COVID or decided that maybe you want to make a good job, a gut job change, Franklin County is looking for a lot of people right now. We have a lot of job openings from part-time to uh, full-time in many different areas. So if you are looking for a job change and you want to work for an awesome employer, um, go on, on the Franklin County website and pull up the Jobs Available tab and um, see what's there. And that's all I have. All right, Roy. I'm kind of like Rick. I got... Uh whole bunch of emails uh, most all was uh, respectful about where respectful for wearing mask or not wearing mask so uh, it was about a 50 50 split uh, uh, of doing it and um, some of them some of it was actually political too and uh, running for re-election it kind of puts a little polit political uh, side to the to the question and and you know anyway that's just the way it was everybody was respectful Sorry. Put a little political uh, plug in there too one way or the other all right yeah i would just say that talked to a lot of folks about this about the mask issue and i think a lot of people are kind of paying attention today to see uh, how the conversation went i hope to leave I guess uh, folks on both sides with a few impressions you know the people who are concerned about civil liberties nobody's going to be forcing you to wear a mask come Friday um, and the folks with the impression that this is uh, order is absolute a silver bullet that will end the spread we don't have the ability to make anyone comply um, you know, both sides, uh, I've talked to, to folks on far spectrums of this, both sides agree uh, they're not impressed watching Topeka kind of bounce this ball back and forth. One side makes a rule, the other one fights it. Uh, it's not productive. What I'm not in a hurry to do is take the county government and jump right in into that not productive conversation. Um, I'm not sure this is something we need to beat each other up on. and. Um, again just not not in a hurry to jump into that so um uh, i guess uh, listen to each other have some patience and um yeah nope nobody's gonna be forcing you to do anything come friday that is against your will but um be considerate of others and uh appreciate the the good conversation we had today anything i didn't bring up the subject only because i feel like that's all we get done anymore but uh, I, I also probably had 21 different emails and calls, and, and it was just about split right down the middle. And uh, I think what really uh, made me really think more about it is when, Derek, you mentioned that actually we don't even qualify to, am I right, to, to yes or no or don't know. or You haven't seen it, so how do, you, how do we know, you know? We may totally disagree. We may totally agree. You don't know until you, until you see what's out there, you know. But I did feel good about it. It would be hard for me to go along with it if I thought we were going to do like what Douglas and Johnson and going to go out there. And they've already issued theirs ahead of the state 
if the state doesn't do it at all, they're going to do it. You know, and they've already said it, and they're going to do go out there and issue citations. And that, and I'd be the last person to to go forward if, if we had to go in that direction. I, I feel confident we need to ask people they need to try to do it, you know. Especially after I got the email this morning that we lost our first person in Franklin County. So, you know, that kind of puts a new twist on it, you know. Sure. That's all I got. All right. Friday's County Holiday. Right. Yes. July weekend. Get ready, Sheriff. <laughs> All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Make a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned. <laughs>